Good morning. Great to be with you. I thought half term would empty the room and it hasn't, which is interesting for something I'm about to say. So anyway, if you have your Bible with you or a Bible app, can you get it open or ready? And let's look uh, together or get yourself to uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, the Philippians chapter two. And please do keep your Bible handy because we're going to be going through it quite a bit today. And if you've got your red book as well, you might want to make some notes because the scriptures I'm going to go through, they're quite dense and I'm only going to skim, as always, in the, in the 35 minutes or so I have. But also, uh, you may want to go back and read them again. I just want to mention something, because um, I, I looked at the song list uh, that, that Ruth had picked today, and I didn't kind of think about one of the songs until it was sung, which is that song, Worth It All. Uh, and we'll look at it again at the end. I won't mention that even to Jeff, sort of to have those words handy, because there's certain songs that we sing as Christians that are incredibly bold. The other one is, I give you my heart. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, have your way in me. I, oh, have your way in me. I always say that should be like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? And worth it all, I was looking at thinking, am I sure? Because it's just an absolute declaration of complete submission to, to Jesus, complete submission to God. So we will bring it back at the end. Um, but I'm going to read Philippians 2, 5 to 11 it's kind of almost like a bit of an early antidote for what I'm going to start to bring. Because today is a hefty preach. It's, it's, it's a preach for grown-ups, as it were. If, if don't mean that disrespectfully. I was just like, this takes some maturity to hear the word that I have to bring today. So I'm giving you Philippians 2 as a kind of entry point, just to remind us of how uh, good God is in all circumstances. The picture you're seeing there, by the way, I don't know if you know, but a neighbour took that uh, of this building. That's our building. That's our cross on the roof. And she took it with a night camera to catch the northern lights. Because, you know, the northern lights were about uh, three weeks ago. And she caught the northern lights. But what she didn't realise is what the cross would do. That cross has just got some LED lights on it. I made it so that it lights up at night. It looks like it's drenched in gold. And I was just like, I love the northern lights, but the cross is even more stunning in that picture. So let me uh, set the tone uh, with Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Have this in mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the time, sorry I should have clicked that on so you could read along with me, but you're, you're with me anyway. Um, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as I said, we, we kind of are going to need that today to hold on to Philippians 2 as we go through what we're going to go through together. Because I'm not preaching on Philippians 2, I'm going to preach on Luke 9. And some of you know what Luke 9 is. Get ready, and if you don't, get ready. Um, it's been described, which is why I said I'm pleased the room is full today. I thought it would be empty because of half term, so many people seem to be away. But again, we've got a full church, which is amazing. Um, but people describe this as the church emptying preach. That's a nice one, is it? The church emptying preach. I'm going to give you the church emptying preach because this does not pander or play to the culture of individualism and I'm number one in the world. This fights hard against that way of thinking. Well, I said worth it all. Look at what we just sung. That's our declaration. That is counter-cultural. And this empties churches of people who are like, I just came here because I thought it'd be nice. I didn't know you want that out of me. So I'm kind of out of here. Some of us will know it. Some of us will know it in soundbite form. We'll have heard bits of it said in tiny three word phrases, but we're going to read quite a lot of it in full. Not a soundbite. Like Pandora's box. You, you lift up the lid and you're like, oh, <laughs> no. Now we're going to pull up the lid on this and we're going to go right into it. Soundbites are good, but the true meaning of this is tough. When you expand upon Luke 9, faces drops, bottoms shift in chairs, 
preachers stammer because we're thinking, I would love to sort of change this because it's hard to receive. So I'm praying God gives me the courage not to sell this short because like I just read, the suffering that Jesus goes through, the suffering that God places on Jesus and in our lives brings incredible fruit, brings such joy and freedom, amen? The suffering of Jesus brings joy and freedom. Okay, so I'm going to try and make sure that we get some, we started a little early today because we want to try and see if we can get some time to reflect at the end. I might even ask that we do, we've got at least one song lined up, maybe, maybe we'll do the Worth It All as well. And just in that moment, like really reflect on what this scripture says, not on what necessarily I say. I'm only trying to line up scripture, which is the best thing possible, and what we're singing in these songs. Because today is going to bring a message of the cross and it's going to make it personal. Today we need to explore the reality of the cross. We become somewhat numb and desensitized to the cross. It's not just a place of salvation and life, joyful though that may be true. But that includes the resurrection and the ascension too. The cross is a place of dying. Told you. Church emptying, starting already. No one's left though, I'm taking that as a good sign. Maybe even in that declaration, we're saying, oh yes, the cross, the place where sin dies. True, true, in part true. We have to add in the resurrection and the ascension to that. But yes, true. But it's also where Jesus Christ dies. But let's be clear, when I read Luke 9, remember the disciples hearing him speak in Luke 9, are not thinking cross, resurrection, ascension. They think of one thing, a place of pain, suffering, torture, and death. That's all they knew crosses to mean. Crosses were not invented at the point of Jesus. They were 200 years in the making. By then, the Romans had perfected it as the cruelest form of execution. It was vile. They designed it to be excruciatingly painful. Suffering was its same. Deeply punishing, but also profoundly humiliating. Shameful, degrading. Welcome to Sunday, everyone. So vile and degrading was it, it was illegal to execute a Roman citizen on it. You were not allowed to, under any circumstances, the Romans said you cannot put any Roman on it. It's too vile. But they put the Son of God on it. So vile and degrading was it that none of the Gospels describe it. You have a look. I didn't realise that until I had a look. All they say, three of the four, one doesn't even mention it. They just said, and they crucified him. They couldn't bring themselves to talk about, describe. The descriptions come from other writings about, about crucifixion, not your Bible. About the pain and the suffering that he was going through during that time. It's, it's not described in the same way we would struggle to describe someone we love so deeply going through. But we couldn't bring ourselves to write it down. Neither could they. We wear crosses. And I'm not decrying that, but we need to know what we're wearing. We have one here, right here. We have that one above the building. Not to celebrate it for what it technically is, but for what it means. To drop to our knees in humble worship, who was on it, and why he was on it. To know that God himself made a way to pay the price for sin, the sin of mankind being so great, that price needed to be equally great, and only fitting thing to do was the perfect sinless one would pay the price for all of our sin. And his name is Jesus Christ. On that cross is no Roman citizen, because that would have been illegal. They're not being suffered, suffering or humiliated. It's the Son of God, and our sin put him there. We'll sing a song later. There's another one. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Like, nice melody. What am I singing? Jesus' life was taken on that cross, but the sting of death and sin also dies with him. Hallelujah. But there's still more to say about the cross before I even get to Luke 9. 
Why am I in such a dark place? Why start here? Andy, we're, it's November. I can smell the pumpkin spice latte emanating out of Starbucks right now. And by the way, you can have a pumpkin spice latte in the cafe, £2.50, anytime during the week. No worries, Ali. You're welcome. Free advertisement. Just, but at this time of year, why, why not do the Christmas preamble stuff? Why not kind of build up to that? I mean, the shop started three months ago, it feels like. Why don't, why don't we do that? Why are we on the cross, dude? Why are we there now? Yes, now. Because as we cover this preach today, without a realization of the cross and what it means, we lose the power of it all, including Christmas. Jesus was born to die. God knew his plan that he would pay for our sin. We lose the significance of that and what Jesus is about to say to us in Luke 9. And as a result, these three phrases become twee and yeah, be with Jesus, hang out with him. Become like Jesus, he can be my teacher. Do as he did, all the lovely stuff he did to heal people and be kind. Do as he did. What did he do? He died. So, so look at this again. Do as he did is not just about being able to, to do the great things that Jesus did. There's an element to this which says, die to self as well. For the glory of the resurrection in Jesus and in me, things in me need to die because I will see the same resurrection message there. The reality of becoming the ones who do as he did is this. Not solely, but profoundly this. <coughs> the core of the Christian message, and you will hear people, many, you know, if you look at people like Calvin and others, they'll talk about phrases that are like this. In order to truly live, someone has to die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who this guy is, Find out about him. German preacher. Stood against the Nazis and was killed for standing against the Nazis. But prior to that and him suffering that way, he knew this to be true and he said this. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. You'll see it repeatedly in scripture. And it's painful and it's beautiful. It's challenging and it's amazing. This reality of death, burial, and resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. And it's not just about Calvary, and we'll come to that later. So if you're ready, and you're not shifted too much in your seat, let's start to read Luke 9, going 18 to 22 at first. Now it happened that when he, this is Jesus, was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that you, one of the prophets of old has risen. And he said to them, but who do you say I, that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Some would say king in that word, some would say Messiah of God. That's who Peter says he is. Let's read on. And he strictly charged them and commanded them, to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man will suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Or some would say put to death. Some would say slain. Depends on what um, Bible you're reading, translation you're reading. And on the third day be raised. This is what I mean. Take a moment to imagine this is the first time it's referred to, the first account. What are, the, what are they hearing? You're going to be slain? You look at later in Matthew 26, 2, it says, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be handed over and be crucified. The disciples are under no illusion what crucifixion is at this point. This is not purely now resurrection life. This is saying that he's going he's gonna to go to a cross. That thing, that thing, the worst thing possible. That's where you're going. It wasn't a figment. It wasn't a symbol. It was a real thing. They would have seen these crosses. You're going there. Let's read on because then it sets this in context. And then carrying on, he said to all, if anyone will come after me, 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For those, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits or loses and forfeits his soul? I can't do three pithy points today. I can't do a really great graphic for you. I've just got this scripture and the profound challenge that it is to me and I hope to you too. Glory is coming, but we have to wrestle with this for a while. I'm going to pick up just two particular highlight points there. Deny himself and cross daily. You'll see the reason this is challenging for me and jokingly called the church emptying preach is because this message, like I said at the beginning, is increasingly and rapidly so countercultural, so against the way culture is set up. Self-denial in the age of self-fulfillment. So let's look at the horror of the modern word deny. At its core, Luke 9 jars with today's understanding of morality and authority. Where do they come from? What guides my morality? What has authority over me? You get to arbitrate truth now. You are the kings of your own destiny. That once we were a people, I remember, I'm not that old, maybe, but I'm not that old. I remember when I grew up, it seemed to be that authority was just external to me. It came from God in some regards, even though I wasn't, I was an atheist, I was agnostic, I never, never sure which one I was really. But I, I recognised some other authority determined what was right and wrong. We respected the police. There was things about authority being outside of me. I believed authority and truth came from outside of me. Some would refer to that as objective morality. But now, and this country you and me live in, is prime for this. Morality is relative. And in case I'm losing you with babble and stuff, it means that right or wrong does not come from anything external. It comes from me. I decide what is right and what is wrong. So, if it doesn't hurt anyone, if it feels good, do it. Married together with, if it doesn't hurt anyone, why does it matter? Those two things, married together. Individualism itself means we merrily trundle down parties which produce the opposite. Doesn't hurt anyone, it always hurts someone. Our culture has embraced a false freedom. And the result of that false freedom is we are unhappier than ever. Anxiety is rife. My daughter works in mental health, and I've jokingly said to her, as many people have, you're never going to be out of work. Tragically, that is the truth. Let's take one example. The false freedom of sexual liberation. Pornography is rife in children. Look at what Helen Roberts is doing. If you don't know who it, she was, she died about three weeks ago. Amazing, uh, a little longer than that, but look her up. She started a, a Christian-based charity called Dignified, going to schools to explain the scourge of pornography amongst children under the age of 10. It's destroying the beauty of physical intimacy that God created and turning it into something warped, Submissive, violent, sexual gratification is nothing to be ashamed of. No one gets hurt. Really? No one gets hurt? People fiddle taxes, drink too much, do too much drugs, sleep around, sexually active, promiscuous. Someone gets hurt. Someone always gets hurt. The strange thing, the, the, the mind-blowing thing for me, Whenever I sit down and try and prepare to preach, two things happen. One, I have amazing revelation of scripture that I've read before and think I didn't really see that, and now I see it clearly, which is amazing. And the other thing is I have a terrible week. I'll tell you about the terrible week later. But let me at least go into the scripture part of it, because I looked at this scripture with a fresh pair of eyes, thinking, how did he write that 2,000 years ago? Paul writing in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, the acts of the flesh... These are, these are the sinful desires, the things that warp us and pull us away from doing good and the godly things. The, the, the flesh term that Paul uses. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. Happy Halloween, by the way. 
hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, factions, man, alive, we're so factionalized nowadays. If you don't agree with me, you're completely against me. Factions and envy. We want it all. Drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He wrote that 2,000 years ago. I thought 2,000 years ago, everything was everyone dancing around and sort of, you know, being happy. Not this stuff. Look at all those examples. And that's not exhaustive. And you realise it just describes so much of what's happening prevalent in our culture. Church emptying, preach Andy, just keep going. I'll admit, I'll save you your blushes. I see me in there. And that's the truth. I'll give you examples later and, and publicly flagellate myself, whatever you call it. But, uh, but I want to share with you, I still see me in there. I was saved in my early 20s. Prior to that, that was my list of like a good night out, frankly. <laughs> you know? But afterwards, some things got dealt with. Other things continued to pester me and pull me away from the things of God. And I don't want it anymore. That's why I got so hung up on the preach. I don't want this in my life. I still need saving from it. Whoever loses his life will save it. Not a one and done. A continual turning away from those things and seeking the things of God. Our culture, our upbringing would say rubbish. Deny yourself nothing. In fact, there's a trend that came out about a year ago, maybe longer, called manifesting. As a Christian, I thought, you mean demons? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Half of you will know what I mean, and half of you maybe won't. Sounds dizzy-like, but it has an incredibly dark underbelly. It's thinking, it literally just find this, thinking aspirational thoughts with the purpose of making them real. Like just thinking, 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 thinking. What do you want? What do you want? What do I want? What do I want? And continually and never stop thinking about it, and eventually it will materialise. You think it's crazy, look it up, it's rife. That young people especially think if you just will it and think about it all the time, eventually you'll have it. Tell that to a kid in the Indian slums. That's a Western privileged position to take. You think, because obviously you will, because eventually you're obsessed with it. You want the girl, I remember this before being a non-Christian. I pestered that girl until she went out with me, okay? Because I was obsessed with her. You want the job, then you design everything around your career. You want money, then you're greedy. And you trample on people to get the money. The manifesting thing is literally saying, turn your mind to whatever you want and just keep going at it and eventually it will come. Then he describes it as some kind of a psychological thing. Because what does the heart generally want? Sorry, not sorry to say, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond help, it says in scripture. I didn't make that up. Sorry, not sorry, your heart wants money, power, sex, recognition, success, partying. Galatians 5 all over again. And just in case we as Christians say, we, well, we're out of all that. No, we're not. We're not personally, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'll take that on me. But, but globally, corporately, we've got a problem too. Because the prosperity gospel says, yes, that's exactly what God's here to do. Give you everything you desire and you Want the large one of the largest churches in America? Many of you will know this is called Lakewood Church in Texas. Congregation, it's great to see the room full today. We might tip a hundred again. This church, 45,000. Joel Austin, our name in here. Do not listen to Joel Austin, please. If you do, get him off your playlist. He is not the right man to listen to. He's a prosperity preacher. He said, we speak the prosperity gospel. Warning, anyone puts any word in front of gospel, it's not a good sign. Just hear the gospel, not some prosperity gospel. His net worth is 100 million. His house is worth 21 million. And people envy him and they say, what has he got to say? And it's pretty much, believe, you deserve it all. God wants to give it to you all. And if you don't get it, it's because you don't believe enough, just like manifesting. It, it was a tiny little faction of Christianity that came around. It, it, it seemed silly. We were like, oh, <laughs> weird little group. Never mind, they'll go away eventually. 45,000 people playing into a culture that wants to have what it wants. It's thinly disguised as self-help, but it's grown massively. 
Why? Because it plays into a culture of self that we are the centre of the universe and that God's job is to fill, fulfil at every need. That is the polar opposite of the message to be an apprentice to Jesus and to do as he did because he calls us to deny self, crucify sin, crucify an object, uh, anything that is obsessive and things we desire in such an obsessive way. Good news is coming. Hang on with me a little longer. Daily cross. Well, cross daily. There's an overlap between the two. These, these two topics really overlap a little bit, but that's not a problem. Remember my opening. The disciples thought this is not figurative when you say a cross. They knew what he meant. They'd seen them. The crosses existed. They were often, people were on there for days and people would mock them as they walked past. It's not figurative, not symbolic. They saw them all the time. It foreshadowed how many of them would actually end up dying. But we've gone dark enough for today, so I'll leave that for another preach. What does cross daily mean for us today? It's a preacher's cheat to say it just means burdens. It just means, you know, carry your burdens daily. It's a bit of a skirt around what Jesus meant. Because when he mentions crucifixion, I've, I've, I've heard preachers on that, that it's not that. I think that's a short sell. Do you know who the Knights Templar were? Yeah? Okay. They, if you don't, they were a French military order, Catholic faith, wealthy, large military order, the largest at the time and the wealthiest in Western Christianity. Knights Templars were baptised through full immersion, but they had a problem with it. They were soldiers, they killed people, and sometimes they were pretty bloodthirsty. So they were trying to figure out, they have to be baptised because this is a this is a Catholic thing. How do we baptize them? Then they came up with a solution. They negotiated. They came up with a solution. We'll baptize them with their arm, with their sword, out of the water. So they'll go down, but the arm and the sword stays out. And then they're baptized. And, and, and many have looked at that as an example of many things. The point being, I submit most of me, but not everything. You can have all of it, but not this thing. This thing that causes these issues. If we were to do the same today, as a baptism pool under here, if, I, if, I, if we skimmed it off and said, right, let's go for it, who's going to be baptised? What would be in your hand? Probably an iPhone for a lot of people. Like, <laughs> just, and not just because you, you don't want it to be soaked in water. You can put it in rice for that, apparently, I've been told. Samsung's are waterproof, anyway. Um, but it's what's on it. It's what's in it. No, that's not coming down with me. Because in there is affirmation. In there is gratification. In there is everything that matters to me. Don't, whatever you do, not my phone. And that's just an example, of course. Jesus is telling us in Luke, and in so many other places of the Bible, to be a disciple, to reap the full freedom of what Jesus offers, which is life and life abundantly, it means pulling everything under the water. To submit it all to him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord. We need him. Let Jesus take centre stage. Full submission to be born again. Full submission to be born again. Fresh, clean, starting again with a saviour who will walk with us by the Holy Spirit every day. To counter a little what I said before, and it's because we could just think, oh, it's all the sins and things. It's whatever dominates our heart, whatever we obsess about. From security of home, family, financial security, these things also can become obsessions if they're not properly submitted to God. Three of the many stories that bring this out, I could, there's many that would bring this out. I'll just reference two of them because we've preached them recently. They were from Luke. 957 to 62, if you want to look them up later, Luke 957 to 62. There's one when a person says, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says pretty much, well, that means you, you become pretty much without a home. If you remember, Ben preached brilliantly on this. It was the thing about uh, foxes have holes, birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Like, you want to follow me? Then you go where we go. The other one was the the man who said, I want to bury my father. Everyone gets very sensitive about this preach because Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. And we think, how cruel. His father's just died. That's not what it means. He means, let me get my family in order and everything settled. And when my father dies and passes away, sometime in the future, when everything is fine, then I can come and follow you. 
And Jesus says, no, that's not how this works. If you want to follow me, you follow me now. You submit that to me and see what I'll do with those things. And then we've got this one I will read from, which is Luke 18, um, 18 to 24. This is the rich ruler, because this speaks to me. Be honest with you, this speaks to me. And the ruler asked him, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all of these I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult, it, it, how difficult it, is, it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Some say he's a nameless ruler because he represents all of us. Not in his richness, just in you can have it all, but you can't have this. Jesus is not saying wealth is bad. He saw the man wanted the kingdom and not the king. And Jesus is, what was my very first preach in the series? Does anyone remember? I said, who is your capital K king? They want the kingdom, but not the king. Those three examples, like a knight Templar, is three men and they're holding above the water their home or their family or their wealth. So why daily? Because we live in a constant tension between the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. Because daily there are things we have to deny, bury, and submit. Christ, submit them to Christ, sorry. And maybe I'm alone, and that's okay. I've just, you just had 30 minutes of self-help therapy for me. Thank you very much. I've really appreciated you all listening. Because I have Galatian-like things that I have to battle with. Daily, sometimes hourly, but definitely weekly. The thoughts and desires that drag me away from the apprenticeship of Jesus and just fill my brain. I obsess about things. They dominate my thoughts. I'm going to get some prayer later about it. Because the fruit of these things is nothing but constant disappointment for me and maybe for some of you. I'll take one of them, envy, elements of idolatry in technology for me. I love it. To the point of obsession. And my wife knows it. <laughs> and I don't just mean I buy stuff, because I, I, I do, and I try to temper it. She will tell me I don't. But I just can't stop thinking about it. You look at my search history. I'm at least pleased to say it's not about certain things, but what it is is me looking at loads of new things. I, it, it fills my mind. If I get on eBay, I'm like 20 minutes later, I'm still there searching through stuff I could buy. I can't really afford, but I'll sell this and buy that and sell this and buy that and sell it. But I buy that, buy that, buy that, buy that, and eventually sell this. I know why as well. It's something to do with my upbringing. I don't want it because it just is greed and it occupies my mind and it pulls me away from the things of God. And I'm constantly disappointed because once I got my new phone, they only went and released another one, didn't they? The Z Fold 5 is out, and I want it. And I'm doing everything not to get it. <laughs> Anything that takes an idle status means Jesus is fighting for the throne in our hearts, the throne in our minds. Idols that are obsessive produce poor fruit. Even the good things, if they start good, they can become an issue. Wanting your children to succeed is fine until it becomes an idol. Until it becomes an obsession that you can't stop thinking about. So rather than be parents, we become performance coaches. And I remember it with my son. If you haven't met my son, you wouldn't forget when you met him. Very shy, but he's six foot nine. Okay, so he makes me look short. And when I was down at the gym once with him, we were in the gym, he was about 15, 16. A guy came up to me afterwards and said, do you play football? He went, yep. He said, you're a goalkeeper. He went, yeah, he's a goalkeeper because I was a goalkeeper, by the way. But he's 6'9", yeah? And he said, listen, I think we might need to see you for a trial, if you're interested. How old are you? 15. He says, you're a bit old, believe it or not, but we're interested in seeing you for a trial. What, what club? West Ham. That's his club. That's her club too, by the way. 
And, and, and then my brain went into overdrive. <laughs> Joel's like, yeah, okay, 15, all right, yeah, maybe. And I'm like, I said, give me your number. And I'm texting this guy, like, when I get back, just to let you know, got your number, this is my number, that's your number, my number, your number, my number. You tell me any time I'm bringing him to West Ham, no problem, no problem. JJ, West Ham! And for weeks, I'm like, well, it's like and Joel's like, hmm. <sighs> but I'm there, obsessing. It became an idol. All I want, and I've got pictures of me at England, like he obviously got to be the England keeper too. <laughs> I'm at Wembley, go like that to my son as he saves that goal in the last minute of a. I'm off, I'm there, and my brain is all over that. Where's Jesus now? He's nowhere. I've got Joel in goal for England. Move over, all you England keepers. He, Joel's coming. It never happened. The guy said he's too old. And I was crushed. Joel was like, mm -hmm. I'm crushed. Because <laughs> it became an idol. You know what I mean? A good thing, if it's work, education, business, sport, anything that's a hobby, if we push it too hard on our kids, it becomes an idol for us, maybe not for them. And I love my kids. True discipleship rests on putting things to death as a core foundation. Why though? Because everything Jesus has for you and me, everything he gives us produces good fruit. Good fruit. You may have periods in your life when you think things are fruitful, but it's not the fruit like Jesus offers. Galatians 5, the rest of it. We've read that bit before, okay, but let's read the next bit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. All of those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires and have that. I want all of that. Jesus is saying, lay down the fruitless stuff and let me fill you with my Spirit and you will produce fruit. Good fruit, but like pruning of a bush or something, something has to die in order for new and good fruit to be created. And remember, these are fruits of the Spirit, capital S, of the Spirit. You're not things that you will up, you, you just try and do better at. You're saying it's a gift. They come from the Spirit, the breath of God, the helper, the guide, the gift of God to help us put to death the fruitless and embrace the fruitful. It's not a one-off event. It's a daily thing, but it's beautiful daily. I don't want my day to be like that. I want my day to be like that. Then come to the Father daily. Put to death these things that I obsess about and fill my mind and give me this. Because to end the day saying my day was just filled with joy, peace, patience, kindness is much better than my day was filled with eBay. For this level of freedom, we need the Spirit's help, though. We really do, which is why I'm saying, come get prayer today if you need help with this. I do. I'm going for prayer. Because let me end with this from Matthew, and then I'll invite the band up to sing um, at least one song. And maybe, actually, what we'll do is we'll sing the song they're going to sing, which is about the cross. Then we'll ask Jeff if he doesn't mind putting it out. But I'm gonna, we're going to read out the words of Worth It All, like a prayer, if you're ready to and willing to. But let me just show you this as we come to an end. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. If we find Jesus, we say, right, hang on there. Everything else I'm getting rid of for that. And I'm even going to buy the, the thing around it to have that. If we truly hear, see, and taste the goodness of Jesus, then you give up everything to get what he has on offer. And I pray by work of the Spirit, because even if it was me preaching, James, it was a work of the Spirit, okay? I'm not going to claim that at all. But, but I pray today, whatever I've said by a work of the Spirit, you've seen Jesus, a new or a fresh, and everything he has to offer, but it comes at a price, his death and you putting things to death. I pray that we want him so much that we submit it all to him and we pull our arm under the water. Say, so even that's coming down. And it doesn't mean that God may, God may deal with it instantly. I've seen him do that. But sometimes, like, Tuesday, down again it goes. And again, until eventually I work out through persistence and prayer 
It's no longer dominating my thoughts. Submit it all to him. No arm out of the water. For the freedom, the treasure, and the fruit of being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing as he did. Amen?